we're doing a kind of joint show. You came all the way from the UK. You're doing some stuff here in the States. Yeah. Mostly crime. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, this is um, kind of awkwardly poised between an interview and a conversation. Let's try and get the flow. I know. It's um, so hard. Yeah. I, we were talking before this off camera, having this amazing conversation. We have mm. that's. I met you during the pandemic, and mm -hmm. you kind of changed my way of thinking, which not that many people are able in to do. In a good way or a bad way? Well, that's a that's <laughs> to be determined. Uh, yeah. No, no, in a very good way because you and I had collided during pandemic around this idea of like, what's going on with making sense of mm. the information ecology in the world? And you were like, oh, do you know about this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy? And, oh, have I told you, let me send you this. And you opened my eyes to a way of looking at sense-making that I had never even, I'd intuited some of it, but mm. uh, yeah, so. But you all were, but you already had, so we started connecting around shared interests. So you already had like the Jonathan Haidt moral matrices and you were using that in your work. You had the integral framing because when we connected, you kind of said, oh, I saw you in the Ken Wilber interview. So you're Ken Wilber. So yeah. there was enough kind of overlap, but maybe I had a few more of the kind of up-to-date frameworks that were really useful. No, yeah, um, a lot more than a few. And and, it, and yeah, I kind of, we, we've obviously been talking, I've been, we've been hanging out for a few days and really kind of fantastic conversation, but like, let's try and get something on camera that feels like that. And we're both a little bit nervous because we know that as soon as the cameras are rolling, we've both experienced that often it's a lot more difficult to get that kind of sense of flow. Proviso. Um, but I also feel like going back to the idea about different frameworks, I feel more like a curator than a lot of the people that I interview on Rebel Wisdom are kind of epistemic authorities on different aspects of kind of sense making or culture. And I consider myself more of a curator, but obviously picking up some of these frameworks and then sharing them and people like yourself who I think are, are observing these phenomena, but maybe don't have the language for it. And then when when you find someone who's got the language for you, you're like, ah, I finally understand or I'm able to articulate it or to process it and make it part of my kind of conceptual framework in a new way. And that I think is a feeling that a lot of people have had when they encounter some of these ideas. Yeah, you know, that, that's really kind of what it is, is that you, as the curator, you have these uh, access to these really interesting structural frameworks for ideas that people may intuit, or it's more likely they see it and they go, oh, that's absolutely correct. Or that's a big part of what explains why we're either so polarized or why conspiracies are flourishing during a time of mm -hmm. pandemic or why, um, social media does this or that or the other thing. And what I found with you is what I love that, and again, it's the same thing. It's like the minute the cameras come on, the the performance aspect of it becomes uh, an interference pattern in my mind. It's always like, well, what does the audience need to kind of get out of this? Mm. And what I wanna do is just drop all that crap because, mm. and let's just see what happens when we just have the same conversation that we have outside for the last few days. Mm. But what, what you have done for me, like I see my role, as less of the than the curator role, as the evangelist of ideas that I think are important. Mm. So when you introduced me to the idea, even the other day you were talking about, hey, you know, have you talked about, have you thought about the Enneagram, this personality kind of framework for understanding mm. d different types of human personality? And I'm like, oh yeah, I did that years ago. And then you talked me through some things, you recommended a book, I already read like half the book. And then that next day I go and do a live show and I'm like, guys, Who's done the Enneagram over here? It sounds like crazy stuff, but here's the interesting thing. And I'm evangelizing parts of it that I think are useful for the framework of, again, making sense of the world and ourselves and introspection. So that's where I think we're almost in a dynamic duo mm. in that way. Um, so it's been real, like, it's been awesome. Uh, yeah, and it's, it's also, I was reflecting, kind of making a few bullet points about what we might cover, including kind of the history of the pandemic. Cause it, interesting, we connected during the pandemic, which was just this incredible, particularly the information landscape and the communication around medical stuff and then the vaccines and all of that real, like, incredible intensity. But the irony is that we, the, the, the things that we share, the frameworks that we share, which is kind of like new paradigms of thinking around you, particularly around healthcare, you've talked about healthcare 3.0, it's interesting that that's not really been the frame that we've we've been discussing. And yet that's kind of our shared background is this system isn't working fundamentally because it's inhuman in some ways. It's not really it's not really integrating what it means to be human. It doesn't have a sense of um, development. It doesn't really have a sense of a, of the sacred, like all of these things that 
we would kind of have probably aligned on, but suddenly the weight of particularly the vaccine stuff and the medical communication and like some many people kind of going off the deep end in various ways. And I'll kind of talk about some of the, the frameworks that I find really useful to understand the rise in conspiracy thinking, which was predicted at the beginning of the pandemic by someone like John Bavaki said, this is going to happen. So many of these things were predicted and they did happen. And I think there's some frameworks that I featured, um, interviews that I've done on Rebel Wisdom that in, in illustrate why that's happened. But it's kind of interesting that, yeah, our shared background kind of got lost in that in some way. It really did. You know, I think the reason, you know, because I forget whether you'd reach out, reached out to me or I reached out to you initially, but typically we're in a space where you're inclined to kind of be very suspicious and, and skeptical of anybody who wants to do anything. Mm. And the minute you, whoever, however we connected, I, I had, I was already quite familiar with you and seeing, um, especially the Ken Wilber stuff. I'm like, clearly this guy and I align on a mm. lot of things. And it's, and it's those things that you pointed out, this idea that we have a reductionist system of everything. Healthcare is just an epiphenomenon of, in, in the US, it's 20% of our GDP. Mm. So it's a huge part of what we do and it reduces everything to an it. Um, and as a result, that kind of flatland kind of viewpoint, Ken Wilber talks about this. and. You interviewed Ken and you you talked about a lot of different things in it, but I was like, yeah, this is a kindred spirit who sees clearly. And then our mutual um, connection with uh, Jonathan Haidt and his models of moral taste buds and moral reasoning and the righteous mind in the books he's written about that, uh, again, resonated quite strongly. So it was, I was actually very excited to talk about healthcare in, in particular with you and those kind of, and the psycho-spiritual issues around human development. Mm. Uh, and then we got hijacked into this, which I think was important and we, and looking back, I think we did some really, and you taught me so much that uh, it's been a wonderful relationship, but um, to actually get to meet in person and have these conversations, is, is it's a different level, right? Th that's one thing I just want, before I forget, mm. Zoom versus this, I mean, mm. how do you, how do you feel? Yeah, there is something that happens in person that cannot be, Zoom, Zoom makes it more functional. Mm. So, so much of human communication happens in the spaces in between. And Zoom kind of makes it, it formalizes the connection in a way, obviously with the sort of, that it's a box, but the, the entire communication, the entire interaction then happens in a very functional way. You may have a little bit of chit chat at the beginning, a little bit of chit chat at the end, but I realize that so much of the, the fuel for Rebel Wisdom and the, I think the, the USP, the unique selling point of Rebel Wisdom, I said was the, the production value, because I was kind of quite pleased that I kind of brought my media training and cameras and, and good audio Looks and stuff, great, yeah. which which definitely was part of it. But I, I was saying this to another person we'd both spoken to, Daniel Schmachtenberger, and he said, ah. no, 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 that's not the USP of Rebel Wisdom. The USP of Rebel Wisdom was curating a, a particular conversation and telling a story of a particular space, a particular conversation that many people have called the sense-making web or the liminal web or all of these different people and then being able to see how those different pieces fit together. That you've got kind of the the intellectual kind of galaxy brains, but you also got a place for practice and you've got a, a place for developing practice developing dialogic skills and listening to what wants to emerge and and that sort of space of what is the cutting edge of the culture, what is the kind of integration that we need to, to exactly as you said before, like the reductionist way that we tend to do things, you're looking at this in medicine, but with Rebel Wisdom, I'm kind of looking at it in so many different areas of the culture and telling the story of an evolving conversation that is moving on to something else that since the pandemic, I think a lot of people are much more aware of because the pandemic was this kind of stress test of the existing system that just showed this isn't working. It was sort of like a near-death experience for so many things and a pattern interrupter where people are now able to ask like fundamental questions of actually we don't have to do things like this. Like fundamental changes to the way that we're doing things are possible at the drop of a hat. And they were kind of imposed from outside because of the pandemic. So there's now an openness, I think, to that conversation that wasn't there in the past. And so yeah, I think the USP of Rebel Wisdom has been to tell the story of this conversation, of what are the broad parameters of it, what who are the people that are involved. And I very much see your what you're doing as being very much the medical 
side of that of that conversation, asking many similar questions, looking at many of the similar limitations of the worldview, and. Yeah, why did I go on that rant? You know, I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I'm gonna answer that for you because yeah. what you're telling me with this is something that I intuitively kind of felt about rebel wisdom. And mm. you said you're a curator, you're bringing these conversations and and the pandemic was a stress test that sh that we failed, honestly. Mm. <laughs> and that's definitely true in medicine, but it's true throughout the, the culture, throughout society, throughout science, throughout technology, we failed. Mm. So. What's interesting, what, what I think the other thing you might add to your resume on rebel wisdom is connector. Mm. So connecting dots and connecting people. So what I would do is I'd watch your show, you'd have BJ Campbell on, mm. who I never heard of, because we just, our Venn diagrams would not overlap. Mm. Like somebody who writes about say guns and and different things like that on a blog, it's not gonna, inter, it's not gonna interface with me except through rebel wisdom. And mm. as a curator that I trust, I would see, oh, he's got this guy on the show. And then you would ping me too and say, you know, this is something you may wanna check out, this idea mm. of group minds, hive minds, what BJ calls egregores, these almost supernatural occult thing mm. that instantiates from individual neurons, i.e. us, uh, given a neurotransmitter like dislike share, mm. uh, and given a, a, a infrastructure of glial neurons uh, called the internet and social media, mm. and what could happen uh, in terms of different group minds that now are opposed to each other but don't even know mm. at the at the neuron level that they exist. So when I say something that is off message for that group mind, I feel the downward pressure of the group mind. Like, ooh, mm. I, mean, I better not say that because, and whether that manifests as audience capture where I'm playing to my audience or whether it manifests as I'm a, I'm a random person online and I just am in that tribe and I cannot see outside of it. Anyone outside mm. of it is not just other, they're alien, they're evil, they're they're bad. So those kind of little connections, the BJ mm. Campbell thing, I watch the thing, oh my God, then I read his piece. I'm like, oh, now I have this new terminology, new structure of thinking. Mm. It then opens connections. And then when I go on my show, you know, I have whatever moderate influence in the healthcare community. I can share this idea parsed through my own understanding of it. So mm. that's the power of rebel wisdom right there. And your particular gift, honestly. But there's also an interesting parallel here between so many subcultures cr were created online. Like this sense of the, the online world leaking out into the real world yeah. has been such a feature of the last 10 years. I mean, the Trump election in particular was the time where it became absolutely clear that there were these sort of subcultures that were trying and succeeding in kind of getting Trump elected. There's, there's wonderful books about kind of, I think that's where the egregore concept came from. It was mm -hmm. almost like a <clears throat> memeing Trump into office that was a kind of decentralized, what Jordan Hall has called a kind of nascent, very early decentralized collective intelligence mm -hmm. oriented towards partly as a joke, partly as a kind of like the true believers, but partly as a joke of like, let's see if we can do this. And this, so in a way there's a, I'm just, as I'm speaking, I'm kind of thinking there's a parallel in that of, it maybe had to cohere online before it can then become become something in the real world. It's almost the incubator. I mean, if you look at January 6th in the United States and the storming of the Capitol, I mean, th these were ideas that incubated online, that cohered online and then mm. spilled into the real world to the point yeah. where, you could see on the faces of the people there, they, they were surprised mm. that it wasn't playing out the way that it had incubated in you know, the yeah, online space. Yeah, that whole, I remember that, um, that was January- 6th. Tw January the 6th, 2021? 21. Yeah, 21. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, yeah so that image of the, the, the shaman, the QAnon yeah. shaman in the capital. Right. So I did a series of pieces at that time about exactly that this was like the return of the irrational mm. it was and i i see that as being the the function of the the internet is this sort of like or we had coherence there was a sort of set of gatekeepers there's a coherence to the narrative there were all these ideas that were allowed and were not allowed and suddenly with the internet we've got the d democratization of information mm. and all of these kind of outgrowths of weird and crazy ideas some of which were kind of suppressed for a reason are now kind of evolving everywhere. And what we have to do is kind of, we can't gatekeep them out. We actually have to confront them. We have to integrate them. And there was nothing more obvious of the sort of, part of it is the, is the irrational, that we had a kind of 
worldview that suppressed anything that didn't fit in a sort of rationalist um secular bubble mm. and there's nothing more kind of obvious than the q shaman kind of roaring to his heathen gods in the yeah. middle of the senate <laughs> of like this isn't we're not yeah. in kansas anymore yeah it's like th there is we are we've talked a lot on rebel wisdom as well about we are in post-secular times yeah we are seeing religious phenomenon now everywhere emerge usually emerge usually in a different way like it's happening through politics on both sides you've got kind of on the right and the left, this new religiosity to politics, which is, and then I I just thought that was, it was the perfect symbolic moment of the kind of emergence from this kind of online ecosystem of conspirituality merged with Trump, merged with MAGA, merged with all these different things. Like the, the Hugh Shaman himself was like a mix of all of these different internet subcultures or general subcultures that just, was was then this this incredible moment of, in a way, it's kind of like a, it's sort of similar to nine eleven in in its sort of mimetic power, yeah, and and also what it symbolises in a way. I think it symbolises the same thing as nine eleven. Nine eleven was the same early like there are forces mm. of chaos, religiosity, mm -hmm. irrationality that are emerging into the world and are shaking your like are shaking the foundations that are much more fragile than you realize. Yeah. And I think January 6th was another version of that with the, yeah, the Q shaman. Yeah, I think I think that's spot on. And, you know, I learned a lot from your show too, in terms of this idea of the religious connotations around what's going on in COVID. So mm. the, and, and since we've given a little airtime to the Trump side of these things, let's mm. uh, look at the religion on the more left side. So the, yeah. the kind of COVIDian thesis religion of, you're impure if you do not wear a mask, you're unclean if you do not vaccinate the holy sacrament of the vaccine, and um, you shall not, shall not enter the temple if you do not click these boxes of religious devotion to this idea of safety mm. as the God elevated in the secular uh, pantheon of, of, of that way of thinking. And a good place to see that is right here where we are in the San Francisco mm. Bay Area, where people are still wearing masks. You're seeing it, right, David? I mean, mm. in... in well, this is fascinating because I I feel very lucky because I the UK we never went f too far down the the real Covidian extreme route yeah that they didn't I mean the most extreme example I think is somewhere like Austria or Germany where they were literally dividing society based on your vaccine status right but even just being in the Bay Area for the first time since the pandemic I'm aware like I'm I'm struck by how um what's the word um not supercilious, um, sanctimonious. Yes. The feeling is here. And I- You feel I, it, right? I would have been radicalized yeah. far more if I'd been in a place like this rather than in London, where generally I think people kind of were fairly common sense about things. People would generally wear masks to be polite in shops, but there was no kind of insistence. It was like, from very early on, it was pretty much up to, up to people to make their own decisions. There was a a real sort of negative liberty bias, I'd say, to the UK. You know, so that's interesting what you say about being radicalized by the environment. So if you notice who came out of this place during the pandemic, the loudest voices of opposition to the COVIDian um, narrative have been people like Jay Bhattacharya, Stanford, Vinay Prasad, UCSF, myself as more the arbiter of like, hey, let's try to find synthesis here, but really uh, spending quite a bit of my time criticizing a mainstream narrative, probably more than not, except when it came to vaccines for adults, in which case I probably um, criticize the antithesis narrative quite a bit more. Mm. But I think it is this feeling energetically of being a little bit radicalized by the surroundings and it's a religious sanctim sanctimonious mm. energy. It's it's you're walking into the the grocery store and if you, even though it's no longer the law to wear a mask, if you don't wear one, you are an apostate of some kind mm. and you feel it, you feel it. People will keep a distance from you and so on. And and of course, I actually happen to know some of the science around this and go, well, you know, mm. this is not helping you, your cloth mask in the setting of Omicron in a widely ventilated uh, grocery store, but it is the religious symbol of, mm. it, maybe it's tribal loyalty, maybe it's, um, a sanctity versus degradation, John Height moral palette. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's- All the Rene Girard's idea of the scapegoat, like mm. all of these things start to come into play, like a deep religious kind of perspective and superstructure. They're the that problem. Is, yeah. yeah, they're the problem. Mm -hmm. Like these are, 
So John Viveki um, said at the beginning of the pandemic, I remember this distinctly, we did a, a fantastic interview right at the start where he said, we're going to see a huge increase in conspiracy narratives. We're going to see a huge increase in scapegoating because what happens is with this virus, it puts us into a very Old Testament way of being. Mm. These are really old patterns and old triggers ah. because you've got this ever-present threat that is like a kind of Old Testament God. You've got these purity codes that come in. You've got effectively you our, our pattern recognition for threat starts becoming hugely over emphasized so he predicted that this was going to happen right at the beginning of the pandemic and mm. was absolutely right mm. it happened um, very fast it happened very yeah. fast yeah very almost instantly yeah. some of our earliest videos before you and i connected were debunking you know pandemic conspiracy and mm. this and that and and uh finding a degree of uh easy audience capture there because mm. My pre-existing audience up to that point were, you know, pretty mainstream medical people that were mm. frustrated with medicine, but were still medically conditioned people. Mm. And when you have people saying, "Oh, this thing is, is a hoax," and so on, and and uh, a planned demic and all that, it really triggers a, a certain morality in mm. that tribe. And I shared that at the time, and I was like, "Yeah, these people. I mean, what is wrong with these people?" It took the pandemic the kind of growth of going through that and going, no, 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 there's, not, there's nothing wrong with them. They're behaving like good human beings. This mm. is like Viveki, Viveki uh, predicted it. This is very predictable based on moral reasoning, religiosity, all the things that both sides, all the camps have. Mm. And so if we can speak to that, to that, actually, mm. we might actually influence an actual synthesis discussion. Yeah. Because they're not they're not entirely wrong. They are right to be suspicious about this and this and this and this and, yeah. and you should question the the narrative. And there is no the science and and mm. all of that. So that was an evolution for me too, because um it was also kind of giving a, a little sternal rub to my own audience that I, I've had a lot of people now uh, who are very upset because, mm. you know, oh, you're giving even by giving the anti-vaxxers an inch mm. you're you're opening up it's like what the national rifle association here in the america mm. says about any gun regulation is giving them an inch and they'll just take away your guns mm. and, and that's what the how the pro-vaccine people sometimes feel yeah yeah it's a fascinating i've seen you go through that journey as well mm. and there's there's two things i'll say one is that we've had an exploration around what is responsible heterodoxy mm. which is being being skeptical about big pharma like of course you should be skeptical of big pharma <laughs> right and it's a very interesting phenomenon that suddenly the left or the liberal left is the one that's saying no you trust big pharma <laughs> absolutely and it's like no pfizer in particular have been absolute fucking assholes all yeah, the way through throughout the whole thing throughout yeah. the whole thing um and so it's like what is responsible heterodoxy what are the things that should be questioned and what are the things where it kind of veers off the road into unsubstantiated claims and why are people only um, selectively skeptical. So you can kind of go into all the different claims, like, and I think the ones that you're right to be suspicious of and the ones where it's like, mm, no, you're making claims that just don't add up here. Rather than going into the content, which is where people, I think, start to get lost, and that was inevitable that that was going to happen. Yeah. It was inevitable that there would be a counter-narrative and it was going to be seductive and there were going to be people who were pushing it. The best thing, I think, is, again, going back to John Bavakey's work, is... Don't pay attention to the outcome of your thinking. Pay attention to the process of your thinking. Hmm. What, how, where are you collapsing into narratives? Where are you starting to, to, to be suspicious of only one side rather than the other? Where are you able to kind of stop yourself in certain kind of thought patterns or thought spirals? And he talks about something called the, the hermeneutics of suspicion, which I think is a really useful framework. But generally, I think it's a mistake. You can kind of you can talk about Mars, you can talk about ivermectin, you can talk about the vaccines, you can talk about all these things, and you have and, and I have to some degree. But I think it's a mistake because as soon as you do that, you start to get into the weeds, you start to get into specific claims, and I think you start to lose your way because it's reality is infinitely complex and you can kind of find all sorts of reasons either side for for believing certain things and not believing others. But surely the, what we have to do is to come back to, okay, what is the process of my thinking? Yeah. How am I behaving? Where am I a, a, attaching too much certainty to certain things and not enough, not enough certainty to others? Where am I negating like people's motivations rather than kind of looking at, looking at the, the wider picture of like, 
as we've talked about audience capture of financial drivers, all these different things that I think people, for example, on the antithesis side, the sort of more skeptical side, are very conscious of the financial drivers uh, of big pharma, of media, of kind of the, the way that they create a certain narrative, but they give a pass to the the fact that saying these things like like pandemic was hugely popular. It was incredibly popular. That that narrative of I'm being suppressed, I'm being censored is hugely popular. I'm the little guy speaking up against the big guy. Those are easily weaponized narratives. And so you get this skepticism on one side that generally gives a pass to the to to the obvious if you look at it carefully drivers on the other side. I think that's absolutely correct this idea of uh, awakening to our own um, thought process, being able to actually observe our own thinking rather than mm. just being fundamentally captured by our own mind. And and so this is a great example when you see people out there who have kind of, you know, maybe we'll name names, maybe we won't, but there mm. are some public people who host shows on YouTube and other places where they started out very scientific and kind of nuanced. And you can see over the course of the pandemic how they get radicalized mm. into a kind of a bubble of A, either all vaccines are bad or every child needs to be vaccinated 20 times. Mm. And and you watch their audience in the comments mm. and they are all radicalized around the same thing. It's mm. clear, like you can look as an observer and go, okay, I know what his YouTube re revenue is from ads mm. because I can see the views. I see what ads they're putting on. They're putting on mid-roll ads. I have some experience with that. Mm. They're making this. The audience is completely captured. They could never do a video that, that it, 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 that and they're not speaking that. to anyone on the other side, for example. Not a single person. Yeah. And that gets into the egregore, like the tribe mind thing. There's no incentive for them to do that. Mm. There's no, there's not yet a nascent large tribe of people in the uh, tribosphere that mm. is looking, <laughs> that, that has enough volume that rewards nuance, kind of creating this corpus callosum between the right and the left hemisphere uh, of, rewarding a kind of what I what I've called alt middle thinking where it's a synthesis kind of seeking mm. and clean bias and the things that Peter and others have talked about and you've taught me about mm. this idea that you know when you're debating you're not it shouldn't be that you're there to win a thing you're there mm. to find truth to have a dialectic to have um, uh, a conversation and you put your bias out there in front what would it take to convince mm. me to change my mind put that out there because if nothing will convince you then why are we having this debate it's mm. now it's just a contest and you're, you're pointing to the really important thing, which is, and I find that if you go into almost any subject far enough, you end up in the realm of personal growth. You end mm. up in the realm of awakening. I agree, like I agree. You're, you're, you're having to pay attention to how am I being hijacked? What are, what are the hooks? Like it, it requires introspection. And I think it also requires practice. Mm. What are your introspective practices? Um, again, not necessarily naming any names, but the people that I'm aware of that have that have gone down this rabbit hole, I don't see that level of introspe yeah, introspection. Agree. From. I don't see that level of introspection. I don't see them reflecting on what are their biases, what are the things that they're not seeing. And I don't see that they have a basis in practice. Like what are the practices that you're doing? If you're just saying, well, everyone else is captured and you can trust us effectively, either explicitly or implicitly, how do you know? Yeah. Like our, our again, John Bavaki, I think, is one of the key thinkers in this area because he talks about the very thing that makes us intelligent also leads us to self deception. Yeah. Because intelligence is about how we find certain things relevant and, and other things not relevant. It's what he calls relevance realization. Mm. And, and we are incredibly good at bullshitting ourselves and finding certain things particularly interesting and certain things not interesting. And then when we're in this media environment where we are overwhelmed with feedback all the time, it's a natural human thing to just be able to completely frame out anything that challenges our narrative and just take in the thing that is giving us infinite, um, infinite kind of positive positive feedback. stimulus. Yeah. Yeah. And, and actually social media weaponizes that. And we've seen that with so many of these figures, like the, the ha having tracked this kind of conversation of all the different public intellectuals, Almost everyone has gone off the rails. Yeah, like extraordinarily, extraordinarily so, up to and including the biggest names. I'm like, wow, the sense making crisis is deep and it is pervasive, and pretty much 
COVID more than anything, I think for the heterodox contrarian space was a was a revealing of how pernicious and how all encompassing the media landscape we've created is and how easily we can lose our way. It, it, you know, and if you don't think it can happen to you, then you're absolutely then you're in danger of it. In danger. You're in danger of it. Every time we have this conversation, I'm thinking in my head, okay, so mm. How has my evolution been? Is it an mm. evolution I want? Am I captured by my audience? Do I care about this, that, or the other thing? Mm. Am I blind? Am I delusional? One of the most powerful things my wife ever did for me, and she's helped me so many times, right? Mm. Uh, Cause I'm an Enneagram six and she's an Enneagram nine, which apparently means I don't know what, but mm. she has always been a source of stability for someone who seeks stability. Mm. One of the things that I, when I started this enterprise as my sole thing that I'm doing to make a living. In other words, I can still see patients, but I'm not making money doing that because it's a conflict. I do this. I told her in 2017, look, we're winding down our clinic. I think I wanna do this thing. I think I can help change healthcare by catalyzing conversations, by evangelizing things that I think have worked, by showing people bright spots. And I think I can monetize it this way and so on. And she said, okay, so I, I need to ask you this. Could you be lying to yourself and delusional? Could it be that you think this because you're getting this feedback from people that that just happen to like you for whatever reason, and you're just self-deluding? Mm -hmm. And I had to st I stop in my tracks and go, this is absolutely possible, and mm -hmm. had to reflect. Now, what we see now, I'm not saying I, I'm not delusional now, but I do have this practice. Now, when I see when I see the people that you're talking about, I see no self-reflection. I see um, a, a dogged kind of blinders on, and the Greeks have been talking about this since mm. antiquity. It's the three aspects of the, of the of tragedy. Hubris, the sort of arrogance that I think I know what's going on here, I have the answer. Ate, which is blindness. Mm. And that's what we're talking about is this blindness to, oh, could it be another way? Could I be self-deceiving? Is there another answer? Should I be talking to people that disagree with me instead mm. of just sniping at them on Twitter where they're not, you know, they're gonna respond in this quantized way. And then nemesis, which is the downfall. Now we haven't seen a lot of nemesis yet. But I think that's uh... well. I think it's slow burning nemesis because mm. it's just who's not returning the calls. Mm. Whereas, how how is your reputation? Mm. What, yeah, it's it's a slow burning thing. I think in a reputational way. And yeah, I think, I think a lot of people's reputations have been severely impacted over the last two or three years. I think it's worse in the heterodox space and the mm. antithesis space than it is in the mainstream space because the culture is still a mainstream mm. uh, centered culture. And so people who have gotten crazy in mainstream are not gonna suffer as much reputational damage, mm. I think, but we'll see how it plays out. Yeah. Yeah. I would hope they do, honestly, because- mm. Yeah. I wanna recap on the, the hermeneutics of suspicion. Yeah, please I tell us about I that. I mentioned yeah. that and- um, And then we moved on, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I made a note. Excellent, and science. I think it's really, really helpful as a framework. So again, this is this is John Bavakey's work on our cognitive grammar. I think he took the, the, the phrase hermeneutics of suspicion from someone else. Mm. Um, but he basically said, so the idea is hermeneutics is how we make sense of the world. Um, what are our kind of pre-existing frameworks? So it's like it's a framework of suspicion, mm. and the idea is that the the hermeneutics of suspicion was became much more popular earlier in sort of the twentieth century with things like Marxism, which said this isn't all of this isn't real; it's actually class struggle, mm. or Freudianism, which is this isn't real; it's it's the unconscious. Like there is there is a, a hidden code to understanding what's going on. And so a lot of these different frameworks became, and postmodernism in a way was was really a, a growth of a lot of these things like um, Foucault, um, sex and power, like all of these things are ultimately, it's about this thing, mm. not this thing. Mm. And the hermeneutics of suspicion, I would say that there's no better description, especially of American culture right now of the hermeneutics of suspicion eating itself has become increasingly paranoid, increasingly conspiratorial, where it's like, it's not this, it's this. And any any statement, anything that is offered is immediately undermined, subverted, or that's not what's really going on. And you see it everywhere. Like, you can just go and have a look in the YouTube, YouTube comments threads, and it's like, this this is full of shit, this is not real. And John Vivekey talks about this as, as like, the hermeneutics of suspicion is is now the dominant frame in our culture, mm. kind of fed by fed by um, alternative media, I would say. But what he says, and this is a beautiful insight, he says the hermeneutics of suspicion 
is ultimately parasitic on the hermeneutics of beauty. What he means by that is you can't have a hermeneutics of suspicion without that aha moment of I know the truth. Mm. So, and the hermeneutics of beauty is that ha- is that aha moment of I see through. This is what's it, it's ultimately a, an insight addiction. Mm. Mm-hmm. So, if you think about you can't because you have to have somewhere to stand. So, the hermeneutics of suspicion ultimately relies on the sense of I know the answer. I know. And, and that is actually a very addictive thing with mm. the conspiratorial thinking is, oh, no, I'm in the know. My sort of small group of people are in the know. And so and also I just had a brilliant conversation with John Babeke and Jonathan Pajot, and he noted that the hermeneutics of beauty is actually how we live most of our lives. We believe that this cup is not going to fall apart. Mm. We believe that the world around us is ultimately knowable. Mm. And then John talks about, so what are the practices that can develop that hermeneutics of beauty, that kind of that sense of trust, that mutually disclosing insight between people that becomes um, what he calls dialogos. So the practices that, that can unfold that sense of trust and shared worldview or shared experience mm. between people that we can then build from the ground up in processes like circling or dialogue practices or any of these kind of ideas. But that the idea of the hermeneutics of suspicion and that being you, you then see so many people who've who've become who followed that spiral downwards into further and further kind of suspicion. Um, do you find it a useful framework? It's a great framework. And I'll I'll add to it by saying so the hermeneutics of suspicion is actualized in an almost perfect way by our interactions on social media because mm-hmm. you don't have the the attractor or the uh, facilitator of the hermeneutics of beauty because you don't have the trust because these are non-playable characters in your mind. Mm-hmm. You, you they're, they're enemy they're opponents. They're facsimiles. They're facsimiles, they're yeah. one-dimensional. And so it's easy to be suspicious of them. It's like what we were saying with Zoom, like how, how did I how did I feel after a Zoom conversation? I feel a little flat and inauthentic and mm. a little off because the nuance isn't there. Now, in the hermeneutics of beauty, just you and I having a conversation, like even mm. if we disagreed strongly on something right now, we would have a sense of, well, I trust this guy is, is good and he's mm. trying he's trying his best to figure out the world. I may disagree and mm. we can argue, but online it would just evolve into that guy's evil or dumb yeah. or, or- But you're right, it's the sort of facsimile world which overlaps with, you're, you're right to, to bring it back to the kind of everyday interactions that we're having. This is a point that Jonathan Pajot made in the conversation with John, which is we're surrounded by the hermeneutics of suspicion in every way. If you take Freud as one of the people who kind of invented or created, set the ground for the hermeneutics of suspicion, his nephew, Edward Bernays, went on and created advertising. So he used that insight oh, of wow. that was of the unconscious to then create advertising. Mm. And we're now surrounded, like the very air that we're breathing, the world that we're living in is created by the hermeneutics of suspicion. We know we're being lied to all the, all the time by pretty much everything around us. And we kind of, we just take this as the way things are. So of course we're then going to have that suspicion because we're being bullshitted to by everything around us. Like we've created a culture that is where we almost don't even see the lying, or it's more bullshitting. And John Verbeke again talks, talks about that. Talks about how it's not really lying; it's bullshitting. It's because we know when we watch that commercial, we don't really believe that that shampoo is going to make our hair less work with you. Um, back but, hair. Yeah, but we know that 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 is not going to kind of change our sex lives, or that car is not going to kind of lead us to to spiritual oneness. But we kind of believe it anyway, or we give we're, we're in the sort of weird half life of knowing we're being bullshitted to, but at the same time accepting it. And yeah. So I think that I'm um, yeah, a good conversation is where you're having ideas while you're, while well, you're well, talking. Yeah. And I'm actually kind of thinking this through for the first time and kind of joining those dots. And it just it does feel like that that will fuel this sense of 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 paranoia, of conspiratorial thinking, because everything about the world that is presenting itself to us is is in some ways a lie. A lie. Well, you had sent me something that kind of made me go, oh shit, because I've seen this in in medical sort of misinformation communities where 
there's a kind of a concrete thinking that happens, an inability to subliminally or, or unconsciously recognize that we're being bullshitted to and accept that as part of the background. So for example, I think it was something you sent me, it was, it was an article written about how in, in old Soviet Russia, people knew when mm. the government said, harvest is good this year, it meant you're gonna starve to death. If they said harvest was amazingly outstanding, glorious harvest for the proletariat, whatever, it meant that it was gonna be an average harvest. And so mm. people knew how to parse the, the standard running mm. lies of the authorities. And people still do the standard running lies. That when the mm. CDC says X, you kind of parse it as Y. This is Scott Alexander, uh, Slate Star Codex guy, now Slate, uh, Slate Astral Codex 10. Got it. But his, so the point that he was making was exactly that, that a lot of what happens in probably medicine as well, maybe you can speak to whether it happened in medicine, but in journalism, there's a kind of private language. Right. And when it comes out of the people, and if you know journalism and politics is a great example, it's like so many of the arguments in politics are like, well, the prime minister, will you will you absolutely condemn? It's like, yes, I think that was that was terrible. Will you absolutely condemn? And it's like there's a private language, or or the non denial denial, yeah. where if you know politics, it sounds like a denial, but if you, he didn't actually say that he didn't do it. So a political reporter will say, will be able to pass these kind of, almost like reading the tea leaves right. of different industries. And if you know what the tea leaves are in those industries, you can actually decode it. And there is a kind of weird truthfulness in there. Yeah. But you have to know the code, the language codes. You need the Rosetta Stone for that particular space. Yeah, so yeah. anyone outside that, it looks like these people are lying all the time. And they kind of are, but they're kind of not. Right. There is a private language. And he was, and what Scott was saying is that a lot of the the suspicion that people have around some of these kind of elite forms of discourse like media or politics is because they don't have the language to pass it. So it just looks like absolute bullshit or lying all the time. But he's saying, no, once you have the private language, and he uses the example of the Soviet harvest, unless they say it's a glorious harvest, they say it's just a good harvest, you better stock up because you're going to starve. But if if you were completely naive and you didn't know the, he took the rules, it seriously. you'd be like, "Oh, it's a good harvest. It's yeah. fine." It's like, "No, no, no. You yeah. need to you, you need to pass start. the language rules." Is this something in, similar? Is, in absolutely. Medicine? And in medicine, this is common because we have our own secret language. Mm. The way we talk about prognosis and cancer, the way we talk about how sick you really are, the way we talk about what really needs to happen for you. Well, you mm. know, you need to get more active. You know, and that may be euphemistic for you're killing yourself with the junk food you're eating. But mm. I'm too diplomatic to tell you specifically what you're doing. Mm. And because there's a part of me that knows that it's not entirely your fault, you live in a food mm. desert, there's social determinants of health. So I'll tell you this, but if you're if you're listening to it from a space of either naivete or mm. concrete thinking or not knowing the language. Or the prognosis for this cancer is good, which but means, that's relative to the fact that 90% of people die from this cancer. Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, this is the best type of pancreatic cancer you can have. Okay, so you're still gonna have to go through hell and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. But, but People don't know that. And, and doctors are notoriously bad at communicating that because they're also um, projecting their own defenses around being honest and you know, especially mm. around end of life stuff and this kind of thing. So that kind of thing definitely plays out in healthcare. Now, now you have a pandemic where uh, even Fauci will come out and say something kind of that sounds like bullshitty equivocation mm. and, and other doctors will listen to him and go, yeah, that's what that's what I would say if I were standing up there because it's kind of like you know you know you don't want to commit to this because we know there's uncertainty, but you don't want to let people know you're fully uncertain, so you'll say it this way. Mm. But anyone who knows will listen and go, yeah, they don't fucking know what's going on, uh, but they're putting their money on this, so let's see mm. what happens. Yeah, and and I think if <laughs> if people really all had that ability, I think the pandemic might have played out a little differently, or if our elected and uh, public uh, health officials had actually just spoken plain English, it might have been um, much clearer. Yeah. Something I've been advocating for. Just tell yeah. the truth. I mean, yeah. this, I think a lot of people have reflected that public health messaging needs to evolve. Like this pandemic was the first one really that has happened within kind of the social media, alternative media landscape. And clearly there has to be more sophisticated messaging. Yeah. Like you can't just do a one size fits all message and expect it to kind of sustain. And actually you're, you're creating the conditions. Like this is something I've felt for a long time is that conspiratorial narratives thrive in the gaps between the official narrative and the reality. Yeah. 
And so all of these kind of little little white lies or gray areas will fuel – it's almost like an ecosystem. You're just creating the the – the ecosystem or the, the the growing conditions for more and more esoteric conspiracy narratives by just this this little kind of shortcut that you're taking in this messaging or the way that you're not trusting people to kind of pass this for themselves or whatever. As soon as you try and control the narrative, you you create the conditions for yeah, for for the pushback against it. Yeah, I agree. It's a it's fertilizing this territory, and then you have structures, techno te- technological structures in place that accentuate all of that. You know, mm-hmm. through social media, and then you create the again. We were talking about in the beginning of the thing, the incubator for this thing, and then it spills into the real world. And what's interesting is it used to be, you know, you didn't hear about this stuff unless you're online and stuff. But now, anytime like someone comes to fix your pipe, or you go to the store and you strike up a conversation, these kind of uh, little mini tribal conspiracy spaces mm. become quite evident in the conversation. It's very quick. Someone will say, oh, you know, you know, the thing about these masks or whatever it is, whatever, mm. p- pick your pick your poison. And actually, it's, it's actually quite strong on the COVIDian side too. Oh, you know, these Republicans, yeah. they want to kill everyone by not letting them vaccinate. And- Which is the thing that I think people, because on the uh Covidian or well, Covidian Covidia. Let's let's say thesis antithesis. Yeah, side. let's use that terminology. I th- I think, and maybe this is a bias because rebel wisdom has been within the kind of antithesis space more or less. Yes, very much the he- heterodox space from 2018 onwards. Because I think there was a really valid and necessary heterodox perspective that was. Um, you're, you're familiar with the the Ken Wilber um, framework, so sort of pre-trans manifestation. Yes. And I think that's the best way of looking at you had pre, which is a sort of emotional, pre-rational sort of an emotional reaction to whatever Hillary Clinton is selling. I don't, I don't want it. Yeah. Uh, Totally understandable and (laughs) very emotional, very reactive. And, and within that, there were kind of reactionary forces. There was some kind of basket of deplorables involved right. in that as well. But that wasn't the only reason why people were rejecting Hillary Clinton. Right. Um, so from 2016 onwards, you had like a rejection of a very naive liberal status quo that left out an awful lot of the world and had a moral superiority and was like, we're a tribal, a hidden tribalism, sort of like we're no longer tribal. We're open to everyone from all, all backgrounds, all sexualities, all races, unless you don't think like us. Right. And so rejected traditionalism, rejected anyone that had sort of a different moral palette around their their kind of worldview, and people picked it up and they they hated it for, yeah. for good reason yeah. because it was very judgmental, it was very sanctimonious, it was all of these things. It was self contradictory, self contradictory, yeah, no so hierarchies had, except for the hierarchy that says there are no hierarchies. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so you had this rejection of the liberal status quo that manifested as a sort of pre rational rejection. I think Trump and Brexit were very much kind of fueled, but fueled to a large part by that. And then you had a trans, um, a more integrated, reflective rejection of that perspective that you saw with with some of the more, um, the intellectual dark web con- at its best. At its best, So yeah. these are the sort of podcasters, public intellectuals, at their best, I think we're articulating a rejection of this worldview that was that was more nuanced and more complete. But over time, because of the nature of the platforms we're using, a lot of them got pulled down into that more reactive space. Yes. And I think it started becoming much more reactionary. You look at some of the kind of more high profile members or people within that, and they're they're now kind of just shouting at people at, on Twitter and making fools of themselves in various different ways. They got pulled down into the the kind of more emotional, more reactionary elements of that. And the irony is, again, coming back to the Ken Wilber model, I think if if more of those people had had that Ken Wilber model, which is the idea there is a second, there is a way of understanding the world, an integrative second tier perspective that takes, that understands that all of these different value structures have meaning, a place have a, a place, yeah. are related to each other in kind of in, in complex ways, we need traditionalism. We also need postmodernism yes. or a healthy postmodernism. That I think w- is is ultimately what they lacked. A lot of these people lacked. There wasn't a real sense of an integration, so it became a reaction to 
the excesses of postmodernism, the excesses of what Wilbur would call like green, multi-perspectival awareness that then required, and if, if people are watching, I have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, the book Trump and a Post-Truth World by Ken Wilbur, written in 2017, I still think is probably the best guideline to kind of understanding the cultural landscape. It, so understanding, if you have that framework, you can then see where you have you have the sort of pre-rational age, the sort of blue like authority, et cetera. Then you have rationality, which was a lot of the 20th century mm. where we were, um, you know, was ca celebrating capitalism and merit mm. and that kind of thing. And a kind of a more classic conservatism, like, mm. hey, you know, we're- uh, Science and modernism. Si yeah, science, yeah. modernism, rationality, enlightenment, the Enlightenment era, that kind of thing. Mm. Then the postmodern era with, like you said, multiculturalism, so widening circles of compassion, yep. widening acceptance, seeing that some views are um, constructed in a way that uh, uh, it doesn't make them as absolute, but then- And, and, the, and the developmental model there is that the, as you were talking about science, modernism, which is coded orange in, in, in integral theory, spiral yeah. dynamics, was, was uni- it was uniperspectival. It's like there is a truth. It is yes. science. Yes. It is modernity. Yes. And then, so there's a developmental pattern here of like how we evolve as well. Right. And then when postmodernism came in, the green worldview that came in much more strongly in the 60s, it was there are multiple perspectives. There are more than one perspective. And it's important that this, this one perspective tended to have biases. It was very male. It was very rationalist. It was very... Um, it, it put everything into its Maybe frame. Reductionist, yeah. Reductionist, mm -hmm. and then there was a, there, there are multiple perspectives, and they all need to. And it was a, a positive development originally, yes. and then it went septic because ultimately it said, and there is no one truth. There is no truth, and yet that is a truth. Yes, that's the performative Became, contradiction. That, exactly right. Yeah, exactly right. And that, but this is all absolutely necessary parts of human development and societal mm. development. That's what mm. a, a real Wilberian would say, because mm. you can go, okay, well then is green, is postmodern uh, multiculturalism, is that the final say? Mm. Where people are upset now is I think, when you talk about pre-trans, the pre people are pre green meme. They're still either living in orange or in blue, and they're, mm. they're, sh they're throwing darts at something they see as ridiculous and alien and not to be had. Yeah. But, but the post green people, are standing in a what what may be called integral or teal color. Mm. I, I've called it alt middle. It's yeah. it's just a new reframing of the same thing. It's looking at it and going, oh, all of this was necessary, but look at the downside of green that you're seeing the shadow of green. Mm. We should criticize that shadow because you want to nudge to the next level, which is this integral level that says, oh, all oh, the first tier two level, mm. where it's a slightly higher perspective, where it says, yeah, there there are all these perspectives, but some are a little more complete, mm. and including all of these as part and necessary and actually honoring people that are in those levels and trying to nudge them to healthy levels of that level rather mm. than dragging them into another level, which never doesn't really work that mm. well. If you look at immigration and things like that, taking somebody from a, a pre-rational level into modernity is always a shock. Mm. Um, that's what I think you're pointing out with trans. So the IDW at its best, Mm. was an integral look back at green going, hey guys, look, see, it's finally happening. Mm. Green is starting to show its age. Let's start to evolve into this new thing. Mm. But what ended, what we're seeing is a regression back yeah. to a pre-state that's weaponized by audience capture and yeah. all this other stuff that we've talked about. Yeah, because so much of the emotionality and the attractive force, once you get the, particularly because you've got this paradox within the podcasters and public intellectuals that made up the IDW of they were outside the institutions. Yeah. And if you look at the, you look at kind of Eric Weinstein in particular talked about the only people who are able to tell the truth now don't have the institutional capture, don't have the fear of being kind of sacked or cancelled. So they are able to speak more openly. And that was what he was saying back in 2018. I think there's some truth to that. But what that didn't factor is the new failure conditions of the alternative. Mm. And I'd say that the mor morality tale of the last kind of four years for these public intellectuals and all of us who've been on social media, and I haven't been immune from it either. Like I feel the weight of like the YouTube comments thread and there are certain things that I'm sure I would have done differently had it not been for that. Um, like we're all subject to these things, even, even subconsciously or unconsciously. Absolutely. Um, but the morality tale of the last four or five years has been 
the failure conditions of the alternative. And audience capture, I think, is the main one. But by definition, these people are outside the institution, so they are much more re um, dependent on their audience, depend for income, for validation, for status. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's kind of inevitable that you're going to be you're going to end up being warped yeah. by that effect. And there's there's some fabulous. Um, I think the one that I keep pointing people towards is the 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 series on Dave Rubin um, mm. called Dave Rubin's Battle of Ideas, mm. which is a an incredibly detailed, sophisticated account of Rubin's political trajectory from 2016 onwards, where he was genuine, I think, someone who was on the left and spotting some problems with the left and how he became more and more kind of... Um, yeah, his political trajectory of being someone just interested in ideas to being more and more of a kind of right wing, um, uh, I won't say demagogue. That's not quite true, but more more Amplifier, of a right. Yeah, yeah, more 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 captured by by the right mm -hmm. as time went on because mm -hmm. of these audience dynamics. Mm -hmm. It's it's a fabulous series. I think kind of essential to understand the media landscape as it is. But we saw so many other people go down that same route because the audience was there the audience had more reactive more mm. emotionality mm. it was a much more kind of stronger gravitational force mm. than whatever kind of nascent second tier perspective was there that was able to appreciate the nuance without like being subject to to bigotry or reactivity or um reactionaryness Yes, of, of ver good various word. various neologisms. Yeah. Okay, okay. So a couple things with that that, that I was thinking about as you were talking about it. Wilbur talks about when a new phase emerges, when a new developmental stage emerges, it mm. needs to capture a certain critical mass of population before it tips into yeah. the mainstream. And a good example is in the 60s, you have the civil rights movement, Vietnam, all that, that tipped people to, it was roughly what, uh, what did they say? 10% of the population, I think, is the tipping point. I forget the exact number. But when 10% is at that level, Mm. And let's talk about integral or alt middle or where we're talking about this nuanced mm. seeing the perspectives from a trans mm. rational uh, place. Um, I think in society now, maybe we're at 2%, 3%, 5% integral. Mm. And that's not enough to have a critical mass that makes it a mainstream acceptable thing, which is why you can start at an integral level mm. and like the people that you're mentioning. And then realize that your bread is buttered by the levels that are below. Mm. And by speaking those languages more clearly, all the audience capture, all the revenue, all the views, all the narcissism, any, any self-validation you want mm. from your blindness is going to be validated there, mm. not in the alt middle or in the integral. And I think um, what's interesting in my own experience is mm. my audience um, is all over the place. But the ones that say will subscribe for five bucks a month to be a member and then have these conversations with me are passionately integral. Mm. And they'll tell you, they're like, you're the first thing that I've seen where I feel like I'm not crazy. Mm. People think I'm some mushy centrist, but I'm not. I'm actually passionate about this. I'm passionate about it. these are my politics, but I see the truth on all the sides mm. and I speak a language that you were speaking. So that's that, that's that audience. And it's not mm. big enough yet to be captured by it. Yeah. Uh it's really interesting. Yeah, and it's it's also the other factor is that we have these political biases but they're being weaponized against us by like you've got the colonization of inner space by the tech platforms. Yeah. Which is kind of the 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 other part of this which is why mm. we focus so much on it. Um Tristan Harris talked about it in the social dilemma a lot. Yep. And you have to realize like which is again why we have to get to the, why the answer comes back to personal growth because our psychology is now being weaponized against us very sophisticatedly by these platforms that are feeding all of these biases, all of these kind of negative uh, patterns in ourselves of like tribalism. Like we, we've got this, yeah, I think it's be best to see it as sort of colonization or hijack, ex hijack exploiting of inner space mm. because we've done as much kind of exploiting of the outside world as we can. And now we've, over the last 10, 20 years, we've been exploiting the inner space as attention, much as possible. Attention, yeah, yeah, attention, yeah. the attention economy. Yeah. And I had a really interesting interview with Tristan Harris where he actually said 
that we have to treat, we have to get back to treating attention as something sacred, mm. which was the first time I've seen him say it in such a way. But a I, I, a re almost religious yeah, frame. I mean, I, yeah. I, I know that Tristan has his um, kind of, yeah, he's, he's, he's I, I think he's got kind of a history with, with some of these kind of practices and, and sort of sees of awakening, some yeah. practices of awakening. Yeah. So I but think the that, dirty that's secret is a lot of these people do. Yes. Yeah. Oh, all of them do. I yeah. Think. All yeah, of ultimately. them do. Yeah. Um, and so that's the first time I've heard him make that link of awakening to. So my hope, my hope, our hope, I guess, is yeah. that it gets so intense that we're forced to awaken. Yeah. Like we're feeling <laughs> so kind of exploited and manipulated and, um, yeah attacked by these platforms that the only way is out. It makes me wonder whether, so this attention hijack is the opposite of mindfulness. Mm. It is actually mindlessness. It's saying, I'm gonna allow my attention to ride a train of thought to thought to thought that's, that's actually injected by an outside agent, whether mm. it's the tech platform, whether it's these likes and dislikes, whether it's capture as an audience member by a, mm. a, a podcaster or whatever it is, and you're no longer present, you're now in this chain of thought, it's the opposite. So the question is, does that cause enough societal chaos and stress internally that, that the suffering alone causes us to wake up or is waking up necessary to actually break this mm. cycle? So it's a kind of chicken and egg scenario. I, I I think you have to come at it at both ends. Myself is my own intuition, but it does make you wonder because why is it that my friend Angelo, who you know had an awakening in 94 and has talked a lot about this and he's a doctor and we've done some shows, he is seeing a rapid exponential increase in people who've had awakening mm. type events where they're now like, oh, I thought I was this, mm. but I'm this and they see the world completely differently. So social media and looks is silly. That, is that generally, in his experience, is that because they've had traumatic events that have opened them up or because they've had um, blissful events that have opened them it's up? It's a mix of things. There's plenty of people who've had trauma that it's the mm. gateway, but he's noticing that even spontaneous awakenings in people mm. who's, you would look at their kind of karmic circumstances and go, it's just meh, mm. they're waking up and he's, He's, he doesn't know why, but he's saying it's a real phenomenon. So mm. could it be that as you start, society starts to evolve towards integral, you're seeing this chaos, which will happen. And then that's why, you know, maybe that's part of the reason for the emergence of someone like Jordan Peterson. He spoke mm. right to the thing in us mm. that is looking for that meaning again. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's, um, yeah. So Jordan Peterson was a big part of the the origin of rebel wisdom because I kind of saw him in 2017, just thought this guy is speaking to something really important and it's gonna go viral, which it did. Looking back, and John Viveki has talked about this as well, the, with Peterson was fueled by the sense of the meaning crisis. Mm. I think a deep, and the deep mythopoetics, the deep kind of religious perspective that he was bringing or appreciation for the religious perspective that he was bringing, I think was really important but he kept being dragged down to the political level. Like right. that was one of, I think, the tragedies of Peterson. To is the pre-level, yeah. Because that's where all the attention is. That's where the heat is. That's where the kind of reaction is. So I I feel like he, he I don't think that was beneficial to him to continue to, to just go back to that, that kind of, it's almost, yeah, it's, it's almost a kind of addictive thing to keep going back to that particular trough. Yeah, and you know, I'll say uh, the first time I was exposed to Peterson was through mainstream media saying this guy's some conservative mm. loony bin who hates trans people. And I and I took interest, I was like, really? And and then I watched him speak. I may have seen a glitch in the matrix, mm. uh, your film and some other things. And I was like, this guy is pointing directly at truth. He's mm. pointing at the excesses of uh, postmodern green meme. Mm but he's coming at it from a clearly integral perspective. He's actually, he, he, he was incorporating meaning and spirituality back into mm. the evolution in a trans-rational way, not a pre-rational way in those early days. Mm. And, I, and that was a crack in reality that I saw that I was like, oh, the mainstream glitch meaning. glitch in the matrix? It's, I might call it a glitch in the matrix if I were so inclined. Mm. That made me think, oh, the mainstream media may not 
have a monopoly <laughs> on truth, <laughs> which I knew already. Yeah. But now I really knew it, right? This, this was something I found at the beginning of Rebel Wisdom was Peterson in particular was a real selection for people who were willing to question the mainstream narrative because they would hear about this guy. They'd go and look at him and like, this isn't who I've been, who the media is saying he is. Yeah. I feel over time he has become more and more reactive and the tragedy for me at least is that he's become more the caricature of himself mm. certainly on twitter mm. than that he was kind of accused of being at the beginning and i don't think he was for for quite a long time mm. but now he is kind of the the old man shouting at clouds mm. on the internet which is a real shame do you do you think it's because he was on the front lines of this sort of charge across the trenches into integral one of the front warriors doing that and he's going to go down and get knocked back until there's enough momentum Maybe. or do you think it's just a more well, complex I th I think, nuanced thing i think that under the under the spotlight of that much attention and that much he was sort of like i've called him the one man lightning rod of the culture war mm. and trying to conduct that much electricity and I think there was a sort of slightly messianic tone to a lot of, or prophetic. Like I think he did see himself in the kind of tradition of, he said before, like the Old Testament prophets who come along and say your your society is out of out of whack. You're, right. you're going down the wrong the wrong path, which I think he very much was doing. Right. Twelve, 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 12 rules for life. Rules for life. The Ten Commandments. They're not yeah. uh, far off. Yeah. yeah two more. Um, <laughs> it's better by twenty percent. Yeah. You got Moses beat by twenty percent. Yeah. And. And I think he very much had that, like there, there was a sense of him connected to something bigger than himself. There was a sort of archetypal power to to his, yeah, the, the, the arc of the Peterson phenomenon. I've sort of very much covered the Peterson phenomenon as being distinct from him himself. Right. But there was this sense of the return of the repressed, the return of Jung, Jung as, as this... Um, the reality of the collective unconscious, the way it manifests through archetype, the way it manifests through story, the way it manifests through these deep embodied stories of culture coming into a, into a cultural landscape that was largely formed by the kind of new atheist, mm -hmm. rationalist rejection of anything that had kind of that. spiritual or religious overtones. And that was the force of what he was bringing was you you're you're crazy if you're ruling out this entire kind of history of of human understanding and um knowledge in favor of this incredibly thin rationalist enlightenment conception of reason and so he was coming with the force of all of that kind of that weight of the repressed i would say this is fascinating because you know we all go through these phases, like we recapitulate societal phases and, and vice versa. Mm. I myself went through the journey of being the Sam Harris new atheist, like loved the end of faith, was like finally someone speaking truth, had always been suspicious of organized religion, didn't understand its role in, in myself or in people in general, and just mm. thought it was a regressive uh, affectation that would uh, out, we'd out evolve as we out tribalized, you know, mm. we, we got less tribal and so on farther from the primordial ooze. And it was actually, it was fascinating. It was Sam Harris who cracked the door to meditation for me mm. because I'd had experiences where I was like, this is not consistent with atheism or or the fact that there is, um, it's all reductionist materialism. And Sam mm. Harris's book, Waking Up, cracked that for me, but I was still quite conditioned by this atheist worldview or that, that sort of rationalist orange worldview. And, it was, so between Jonathan Haidt, who had a beef with Sam Harris back in mm. the day, and it, and a lot of it was framed by outsiders as well. You know, see Haidt is actually saying religion has these positive merits that mm. have to do with, you know, uh, the elephant and unconscious stuff and I mean, Jungian kind of stuff and, and things like that. And then Peterson saying the same thing, actually, and then Harris doing a whole app about spirituality. Mm. Suddenly you start to feel your own self, for me, this is just my story, evolving into, oh, wait, no. <laughs> mm. There's this, but there's also this. 
And it then, and Peterson really pointing right at it in a way that you viscerally feel it, like you come to mm. life. It, his his lectures, I think you've said this before to mm. me or to others, his lectures are like, you know, like a journey of mm. the early ones. You're just like, you're, oh, you feel an opening. It, it's almost supernatural. Supernatural mm. meaning it's not reduced to, oh, just this idea and this idea. No, there's something that happens, yeah. like a good movie or a flow state. Yeah, and, some yeah. of his former students talked about his lectures as being like a psychedelic experience. Mm. And he, even even some of his sort of strongest critics at the University of Toronto said, um, I saw an interview with one of them where the guy said, well, he was a lecturer there and said, I think I've had maybe one student in my life say that my, my lectures changed their life. Whereas something like, something ridiculous, like 25% or a third of Peterson's Students say that his lectures were life changing. It's a frame shift in perception. Yeah, frame yeah. shifting, which which you can tell when you, and he was he had the ability to to reflect on his own thought as well in a really powerful way. Uh, um, yeah, which at the time where he was able, it's to almost say recursive. That, yeah, yeah. Where it was like this is why my lectures are having the effect that they have because people say when they listen to me that I'm saying stuff they already knew. Yeah. He's like, that's what archetypes do. That's the power of these archetypal stories uh -huh. is to arrange things that you already knew and that you can feel them go yeah. and arrange themselves within your psyche. And it's like these, these, that's the power of truth in a way is it has this sense of familiarity mm. as well as the sense of novelty. There's a sort of weird mix of novelty and, and familiarity. Yeah, absolutely. You know who had that effect was uh, Joseph Campbell. Yes. Had that effect. And if you go back and listen to Bill Moyer's thing with him, which mm. I did recently, it's like, mm. it was in the eighties or something. And it's like, it's brand new. And yet it's so primal, so primitive, so connected to some deep truth. Mm. You almost feel like it's new wisdom that's just so ancient. It's a mm. very, it's a very paradoxical thing. And it, it almost forces you into a kind of um, awakening path because mm. you go, oh, the hero's journey is this. And 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 Peterson was doing the same thing. Mm. It's kind of like, you know, get the hell out of your chair, go clean up your room. Like that's just mm. the minimum necessary, necessary, but not sufficient. Yeah. And then the goal is awakening. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, yeah, why I feel a sort of sense of, that's what I think Peterson should be doing more of is Something like the the power. I think it was the power of story. The Bill Moyers. I, th and, I think that was right, or the power of myth, or something. Maybe yeah, we have one yeah. or two uh, mm -hmm. with Joseph Campbell. Like that's something I would love to see him Peterson him do, do. And, and kind of because that's what's really fueling him is that sense of the kind of. And I don't think people necessarily realize like how unusual that was. He was told to stop talking about Jung when he was in academia because he said people won't take you seriously. Mm. But he was obviously deeply passionate about it had he's come out recently and talked about his own psychedelic experiences which he'd hinted at in the past mm. but in the recent conversation with richard dawkins he talked about on multiple occasions having seven grams of dried mushrooms peterson massive, yeah massive heroic doses of of mushrooms that's amazing it doesn't yeah. surprise me at all we can talk mm. about that but I, it doesn't surprise me at all what's interesting is that he had that conversation with dawkins mm. so dawkins had an amazing conversation with sam harris mm. where they talked about um meditation and psychedelics and mm. dawkins has done none of that yeah and sam took him through a meditation mm. on in the podcast and dawkins when when they're done he's like i just don't get it i don't see the like it's just boring. I, I, you know, my thoughts were racing, et cetera. And um, it made me think like, again, like when we, when we talk about, um, let me just fix this thing that I broke. There we go. When we, when we talk about these kind of people that are these kind of archetypal agents of phase shifting thought, mm. almost all of them have had either some spiritual awakening or mm. a, psyched, or a series of psychedelic experiences. Jonathan yeah. Haidt talks about this. Yeah, Actually, it was something that I, I we were emailing back and forth about and, and he's publicly talked about this, that mm. it was a huge part of his own shifting consciousness was his experience when he was young with psychedelics. Mm. Have you had a lot of that experience yourself? Yeah, yeah. it's interesting just reflecting on the two things that I'm seeing, so now psychedelics is kind of everywhere. Yeah. I mean, it, it's huge. It's almost it's, pop culture, yeah. Yeah, it's it's become, I've been covering the kind of re return of psychedelic medicine since about 20, 2008. I wow. did a story about the first presentation of psychedelic medicine to 
the Royal College of Psychiatrists in the UK, which was actually an MDMA study, Michael Mithover's MDMA study. And I was the first like TV journalist to be, to be following it. And I've always been interested in psychedelic medicine in particular as what is it about? Because it, it challenges the current medical paradigm. Yeah. It really, fundamentally. Fundamentally, because yeah. it's like, it, what is the psyche? Yeah. What is the natural healer? What, why is a psychedelic experience, a transcendent psychedelic experience in itself healing? Yeah. Like this is, ha and the effect that it's had on alcoholism, the fact yep. that it's had on autism, there's, there's the effect now they're doing all sorts of trials that were happening in like up until the 1950s, 1960s, then went underground. And now it's a huge growth area returning to the psychedelic medicine conversation. And I also look at lots of the most prominent people within culture now. Psychedelics is a huge common factor. Yeah, common, common factor, factor yeah. Particularly in sort of the, the, the kind of public um, intellectual space. Mm -hmm. Also, a lot of people doing jujitsu as well, which is interesting. Brazilian jujitsu. Jiu yeah, I've noticed that too. Sam Harris talks about that a lot. Yeah. Sam yeah. Harris, Joe Rogan, yeah. Russell Brand. Um, uh, yeah. Enough M reason not, not to do it. Yeah. <laughs> too um, many intellectuals start talking about it. You just want to avoid it. Well, it also shows that there is something about the way we're showing, there, there's a deep interrelatedness between our physical practices and the way that we show up in the world. Mm -hmm. And you can think about why that why that is. And I think that's what makes Joe Rogan, for example, a much better interviewer than someone like Dave Rubin is he's been punched in the face multiple times. <laughs> and you you just get the sense of like yeah. there's there's nothing that's gonna phase him because phase him. because of his physicality and the fact that he's kind of yeah, he's gone through the the, the process of being um yeah, being He's embodied. Yes, he's embodied. He's embodied. Exactly. There's yeah. a sense of Joe Rogan as that embodied person because of that. I think. No one would ever accuse Joe Rogan of being a head, a brain, and a vat. Yeah. Like that would not work as mm. Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan is this mind body continuum. Yeah. And he embodies it there. His body language is like, you mm. know, when he was talking to, I think I saw a piece with uh, Eric Weinstein, Weinstein, Weinstein talking about um, uh, some controversy that he'd had. And he's just like, hey, yeah, well, tell me about this. And you know, well, the, look, look what's going on. And his mannerisms and everything, mm. he embodies what he's yeah. energetically communicating. And that's powerful. And, and you know, Joe's and done- he also a, talks about um, psychedelics. He's done a lot of that, DMT, yeah. yeah. Well, also <laughs> that he, he reflected on one of his DMT experiences relatively recently where he said that he had the experience of being laughed at, that that he did the the DMT and he just had this image of all these all these kind of entities in, in yeah. Joker hats looking at him, pointing and laughing. And he was like, Ooh, oh, oh, actually, no, that's exactly. And then he realized like, oh, stop taking myself so seriously. Yeah. And so it seems to have a, yeah, kind of an, a, a- Therapeutic uh, growth Therapeutic effect. kind of ego- um, What's the word? Dis, dis, disrupting or loosening. Ego limiting. Effect. Limiting, that's good. Yeah, yeah my, my experience with psychedelics is that it takes the ego, it's almost like an energetic process. It's not a thing and it mm. just goes boom. And yeah. while, it's, while it's disrupted and open, there's a lot of stuff that can happen. Yeah. And before it closes, part of the integration is trying to see what you can change. Yeah. So when it closes again, because it will close again, mm. you know, this idea that somehow Doing doing some psychedelics going to magically um, permanently fix all your problems is mm. crazy talk, and there's yeah. a lot of downside which we can talk about. But yeah, um, yeah, I'm 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 increasingly I've always been quite wary because I've had very powerful experience with psychedelics, but I've also when I did them at university in particular, I I, I had incredible transformational experiences yeah. and then just started trying to chase that high. Mm -hmm. And what I find is that you get a couple of freebies yeah. and then you come start coming up more and more against those limitations in yourself. In yourself that you haven't worked that out. You haven't worked you haven't through done it. The it's hard like you've work. got to do the work. You have to do the work. And yeah. I've, I've also, so I originally met my uh, co-founder Ali at the Breaking Convention psychedelic conference in the UK. Mm. And I, I've been in and around that kind of culture for a while. My sense is that far too many people within psychedelic culture fetishize that state, yes. fetishize that experience, 
and don't do the work to try and live more yes. from that place. Yes. And so I've been pushing them more and more towards some of the really good deep transformational work that I'm familiar with, stuff like Path of Love or the Essence work, where you learn to live, like learn more about your own kind of psychology, learn what are the limiting patterns and how do you, because the, what, what's peculiar to me is that going back to someone like Aldous Huxley, who's mm -hmm. kind of one of the fathers of the psychedelic, who wrote The, the Doors of Perception, and even, even that the title of that book was If the Doors of Perception Were Cleansed, Everything Would Appear to Man as It Truly Is, Infinite, which is mm. a William Blake poem. Mm -hmm. So, and he talked about there, like, that the psychedelics were removing the limiting filter of the mind. Right. That effectively our, our current waking consciousness is like a reducing valve right. for what's really happening. Therefore, if you know that, then surely you should be looking to do the work outside purely the psychedelic to 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 clean clean those filters. Yes. Or to to try and at least understand what it is about our current waking consciousness that stops us from from having more capacity, from more awareness. And often they're to do with our conditioning, they're to do with our upbringing, they're to do with our limiting beliefs. And yeah, more and more I'm I'm interested in the sort of therapeutic modalities rather than the psychedelics because I feel like it's more difficult to integrate that psychedelic space. It's, it's too overwhelming a, an experience sometimes. I agree a hundred percent. I think in those communities that are very fixated- I'm tripping balls right now. Me just too. To let everyone know. I see three of you and they're all like tie-dyed. Yeah. Um, there's a lot, there, there can be a lot of magical thinking. There can be a lot of weirdly um, reification of the ego structures and personality Psychedelic structures. narcissism is a yeah. real thing. Real thing. It's it, a terrifying thing as it, well. Yeah, yeah, it's almost like addiction to spiritual bypass that comes from the psychedelic experience. Like, oh, I can just escape into this Well, it's thing. having a vision. It's, it's like Jung talked about the self and the self or the self and the ego. Mm. Self with a capital S, which right. is, which is the, the greater, our, our potentiality and that sense of a, of a, of a larger, um, more, um, yeah, a, a dimension of being that we can tap into. But when the ego tries to make it about us, I am that, I yes. am that thing, that becomes, we, we basically crystallize the ego around the experience. Yeah. And that's, that's where psychedelic narcissism Psychosom comes from, where, we, where the ego makes, it, makes this kind of sense of transcendence and potentiality into a personal egoic story. And it's dangerous. And to be fair, you can get the spiritual ego from being a, 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 a advanced meditator, from yeah. going on multiple retreats. They're the retreats. worst, actually. They are the worst. <laughs> well, you know, I am so awake that I don't use the word I anymore because there's no self, so it's this body yeah. mind. David is no longer present. <laughs> it can only be done in a Californian accent. Yes, you yeah. have to do it that way. You could also do it in a New Zealand uh, accent, like uh, Jermaine and Brit. Jermaine and Brit. Prison. Jermaine is no longer present. He's not present. <laughs> He's no longer present. That's, God, your accents are disturbingly, to my American ears, yeah. quite good. Um, um, but th there, there's there's one other thing I wanted to say to that. Oh yeah, the, like, why I think the meditative, I'm, I'm kind of being a little bit flippant saying meditation is the worst, but genuinely I think they are, it's a dangerous, another dangerous path because it's a, epistemic closure. It's a very closed worldview because mm. it's one path of awakening for sure, like meditate until things dissolve. And, mm. But the problem is you also need the therapeutic yep. side. You need to work through, you need to look at your relationality with others. You need to look at all of these things. The problem with, with if you become too deep in the meditative world is that it's a self-enclosed bubble where it says that, no, you, you don't need to work on your on your stuff. You just need to sit with it until it dissolves. You just, you, you can start questioning and undermining even the need to do that kind of work. Yep. And I've seen that so often with, with experienced meditators where they, re, where they refuse or reject or will not go into the, the necessary relational work because they think they've got a kind of universal solvent for, but they, meditation can be sold as a universal solvent and it's not. There's, there's multiple levels and layers of development that we need to deal with at, at each time. And different practices work on different elements of that. There's a 
point of view that's taken by some meditators. And I find mm. myself drawn to this and I have to recognize mm. it and stop. It's a kind of a, a point of view that there is no ego, mm. that there is no personality, that this is an appearance out who of- Who is asking that question? Yeah, who's asking the question? Who needs to fix themselves? Mm. Who needs to do the work? Look for that who. And when you see through that there's no who and that it's all this, yeah. then you'll see the silliness of your pursuit. Now, mm. the best teachers are the ones who say, yeah, you wake up, you also grow up across these lines of development. Again, there's a partial we'll, truth in that but it's only a partial truth. It's partial, exactly. Yeah. Like sure, you can you can inhabit unbound contentless awareness and it mm. will feel like there's absolutely no self mm. and everything is perfect as it is. And then five seconds later, when you're back in your body yelling at your kids, you'll realize how mm. irrelevant that is to yeah. actually being good in the world. And and there's a there's a saying, I forget who said this, but they said, if you wanna know whether you're, you know, have a spiritual ego or you're trying spiritual bypass or whatever, just talk to your friends and see what they say about you. <laughs> and and listen. Or go and spend time with your parents. Go sp If you spend time with your parents for a week, mm. it'll it'll disabuse you of any awakening, any mm. enlightenment that you think you have, any liberation. Yeah. Yeah, it's exactly right. Yeah, it's, it's a deep spiritual truth, I guess, um, <laughs> I believe. Um, that those two things are true at the same time. There's mm -hmm. a truth that this moment is exactly as it is. Perfect. Perfect. And at the same time, you maybe need the stuff that you need to do. You maybe need to set a boundary. Maybe you need to kind of look at the way that you're treating your kids. Maybe you need to look at the way that, like all of those things can be true at the same time. And the problem is when you confuse those levels, particularly having looked at sort of cult dynamics, there's a real danger because people mm -hmm. can gaslight mm -hmm. themselves mm -hmm into, well, no, I, I I invited that into my life. Yeah. And there's some way that that can be true, that right. you you were naive and you did let that person take advantage of you. But maybe the thing you need to do right now is to set a boundary. Maybe it's to take that person to court. Maybe it's to, and I've, I've, I've covered in particular one cult um, that I was looking into for quite a long time and looking at doing a, a documentary on. And I found this pattern so many times with the people who'd gone through it where they they were made to question their own reality in such a way that meant that there was no that yeah there was there was no growth and no accountability within that whole dynamic and they would just effectively kind of gaslight themselves into yeah. into I, I created that reality. Absolutely. Easy. Um, it's easy. Yeah. That's it's so and that's why you when you were saying meditators are the worst you're not really joking there. What you're saying is this is a scenario that sets itself up as a failure condition to actually encourage this. And Sam Harris and others have talked about this quite a bit. The, mm. the conditions where you end up with a guy, you know, an Andrew Cohen or someone who's really like, mm. you're like, wow, like this person's highly realized and incredibly mm. abusive or, mm. you know, an alcoholic or whatever it is where you would think, well, if the universal solvent of divine being is, <laughs> is mm. actually that good, why would these things happen? Because mm. both are true, like you said, and and both are manifestations of this, of, of reality. Yeah. So you have to do that work. That That's why I think, you know, something something like an ayahuasca journey or something can be interesting because mm. it can force open the doors where you have to confront some of this stuff yeah. in a way that isn't the transcendent um, bypass of- I've seen a lot of people in that situation that ayahuasca is the thing that's opened them up. Yeah. Because I think, may, I don't know why, is it because it boosts the kind of, you can't ignore the emotional reality. Whereas I think with meditation, you can actually end oh, up yeah. ignoring the emotional yeah. reality. Yeah, you can let um, it go. Yeah. Now, now the best teachings I've heard are saying when emotion arises, dive into it, dive mm. into it, see where it's coming from. Don't try to think about it, but mm. just feel it raw because the emotion yeah. wants to express. But others are like, oh, it's just another passing cloud. Let it go. You There's know. no meaning to it. There's it can, no meaning. It can be nihilistic as well. Yeah, it can. Yeah. In fact, I think uh, you know we were just talking about the movie Everything Everywhere All at Once. This ni nihilistic bagel mm. that uh, they they talk about, where if everything's possible and nothing is real, then what matters? Mm. Right, but the truth is, you can find deep. And ayahuasca is one of those that that does do that. It's almost um, you know, we were talking offline about this. It's a, it's a feminine kind of energy that that forces you to feel things mm. uh, that are can be very uncomfortable, but they can also be quite revelatory and give you insight when you go back into the world. And if you embody that, it's also a very embodied kind of experience where mm. you feel the physicality of it. And, uh, you know, I had done one of these journeys a few years ago and um, it was transformative. Mm. And and 
for the couple four weeks after the journey, when I would I would talk to anyone who would listen to me about it because I wanted to integrate it while it was still while I was still open. Um, it was a lot of body language. Like when mm. I would talk, I would speak with hands, and it felt embodied. So it's a very unique kind of uh, kind of thing. Mm. But again, I don't say go out and recreationally go you know go do these things. It's part you have a guide, and it's part mm. of a you go with this intent yeah. and a set and setting and. I mean, that is something I think is really good about ayahuasca is it's still often framed within that kind of ceremonial context. Exactly. It's very, whereas LSD or some of the other psychedelics have Drop it now, and go. And, yeah, yeah. So certainly in the UK, there was sort of a culture of um, very hedonistic culture around psychedelics that I think is kind of un, unhelpful. Yeah. Um, whereas ayahuasca, where it is offered still has that sort of shamanic space holding context and again there's better and worse shamans there's some horror stories oh, around I that bet. as well i but, can't imagine yeah. but there is i think recovering that sense of ceremony that sense of set and setting that sense of um yeah the the the, the environment that you do the environment of the of of the experience is going to be fundamental to your experience so don't don't um drop it at a party. Right. Don't take acid at a party and then try and confront your kind of trauma of your of your parental upbringing in the middle of a kind of dance floor. It's probably not a great it's idea. It's probably not the best idea. It yeah. gets back to Peterson's strengths mm. where he's pointing out the meaning component, the archetype component, the Jungian components of this, like a good ayahuasca ceremony, like you are going in with this intent of mm. there's gonna be unconscious stuff that's coming out and all this medicine does is shows you your own unconscious and it's bringing it out. And yeah, you can say, oh, there's this mama ayahuasca and you know the entities that are trying to help you and whatever your belief around it is, the experience of it is, is you're seeing things about mm. yourself and you're shown this mirror and, and then you decide how you're gonna integrate it. Mm. And that sense of meaning, the sense of, um, Kind of, you know, and, and and again, the ceremonial aspects of it add a lot to that sense of meaning mm. that I think we've stripped away. I think that was part of probably the reason that the '60s kind of failed as a psychedelic renaissance mm. in that way is it, all the all the all the trappings of ceremony were taken away, and it would, it became this kind of mm. thing that you're talking about in the UK now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. lack of ritual is a big thing. in yeah. the culture. It really is. I, I forget if Height talks a lot about ritual, um, but. I forget who was really focused on ritual as a thing, but it, it, it is uh, crucially important. Um, so let's see, we've talked about a lot of stuff now. We're coming up on two hours. Mm. What else have we, what stone have we not? I mean, there's a million. Or are you- um, Let's see, second selfing we haven't really touched. Oh, wow, the second self. Second self. So we were just talking about how the, we were just talking about how the first self <laughs> can be seen through as mm. a type of illusion yet has truth to it. It's an aspect of reality. It's a lens through which we experience through this experiences. But the second self is something Peter Lindbergh that you turned me on to mm. that, yeah, that, that maybe describe it for us. Yeah, so Peter has an uncanny ability to, we say he's good, got good coinage game, <laughs> which in itself is good coinage game. Yes, it is. Um, it's very I th meta. I think he came it's up with that as well. Very meta. So oh my God. Peter has the ability to to name and come up with really good frameworks for certain dynamics that really help kind of illustrate what's going on. I think he's one of the the most interesting thinkers along those lines. Mm. Um, the other framework I think that's really important for people to to get is his mimetic tribes. Oh, it's a crucial piece. one. Yeah, when you sent me that, it was a game changer. Yeah, yeah. like I, I genuinely believe that he wrote that in I think 2018. Right. And it was, he intended it as a kind of psychoactive piece because it talked about the different, he talked about culture war 2.0, how culture war 1.0 was basically left versus right. It was split along sort of the classic kind of lines that were established in the 50s around, um, 50s and 60s around kind of abortion and um, the, the the classic left right dynamic gay marriage yeah. yeah and and how what we now have is a multipolar war mm. where some of the most intense conflicts are actually on theoretically the same side 
and you, you can take look at that very easily, like the, the never Trump Republicans versus the Trump Republicans or on the, the left, the kind of social justice um, warriors, social justice the... warriors or around the, 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 the trans issue mm -hmm. where you've got kind of the turfs, supposed turfs, um, trans exclusionary, trans -exclusionary radical, radical, feminists. Fe radical feminists versus the, the kind of trans rights activists. Like th this is where the most heat in the culture now is, yeah. I think, around some of these other dynamics that are not strictly left versus right. Right. And he then came up with all of these different tribes and said the these are the active agents in the in the mimetic landscape right now. Right. And came up with like I'm not sure how many there were at the time. Yeah, there were a lot, yeah. Yeah. Maybe eighteen or so right. I've got in my mind. But he he intended it to be okay, so each of these tribes have a, has a specific goal. They have a specific uh kind of pri kind of prime movers within it, like the chieftains of the tribe. They have specific fears. There's there's a whole like constellation around them that they have a kind of telos, a direction, mm -hmm. and a fear of what they're what they're scared about, what they're trying to achieve. Very brilliant piece that I think you have. It's it's almost a formation piece. You can't. I think you have to start with that. It, it's it's a it's a structure that I think you need to integrate to actually understand what's going on. At a, at a deeper level. And it had that kind of effect on an awful lot of people, I think, when they when they read it. Yeah, especially when you recognize your own tribe in there and you go, yes, oh, Yes, that's yeah. why it's psychoactive, he yeah. said. Because if you recognize your own tribe, it pops you out of yeah. merely being part of the landscape and seeing that there's a perspective. Tier two. Like a, a, yeah. we, we talked about earlier about the idea of like, how, how do you give people an experience of seeing that there is a meta perspective yes. or that there is a, a way of, seeing things from the sort of top level of the operating system rather than being lost in one of the apps effectively is yeah. another way of looking at it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. In, in a way, uh, all, a lot of spiritual practice is that meta level of observing your own mind yes. from a meta perspective, from the yeah. integral tier two perspective, mm. from the mimetic tribe piece. He laid it out, he goes, here are the tribes. But before that, he mm. set it up in a way that I thought was brilliant. He said, why do we even have the fractured information economy mm -hmm. and mimetic tribes that we have now, it's because of these crises that have mm -hmm. happened. Number one, the meaning crisis, which we got with Jordan Peterson when we were talking earlier, we were talking mm -hmm. about this idea that we've lost the central sources of mythology and meaning that have mm -hmm. often tied societies together with no value judgment on the nature of that myth, but mm -hmm. it was a common shared reality that we yeah. could say, ah, well, that, that goes away in the post sort of rational, secular, fragmented internet world. Then you have the, um, uh, let's see, what are the crises? A proximity crisis, mm. where you are now put next to online ideas that would have been separated by hundreds of miles or thousands of miles. And mm. the statement, good neighbors are made by good fences mm. applies to that. Now you're pushed up against ideas that really are abhorrent mm. to your own moral sense. And you have to fight because yeah. you're there. Uh, then you have the addiction crisis, which is social mm. media itself hijacking our dopamine and our limbic system to try to um, get us hooked into the social media world where we do score dopamine hits for fighting other tribes. Then mm. you have the, uh, what was it? The weaponization or the conflict crisis where state actors mm. are actually using these tools to control and manipulate populations, whether it's Russians and Americans doing these things. And then there was another crisis, which I'm forgetting, but mm. there are a lot of crises. There was one crisis about um, that involved um, Beatles having sex with beer bottles. I remember that one. Yes, and that, uh, yes, that was, was that? A, that was the- um, Sort of like a salience crisis. It was a salience crisis. Yeah. That example, it's an Australian beetle yeah. that almost went extinct because Aussies love their beer to look- Stubbies, the, yeah. It, stubbies. It looks like the butt of the female beetle. And these mm. beetles saw the world through this interface that was tuned. So I interviewed Donald Hoffman about the nature mm. of reality and do we see reality as it is? And mm. he used this ex ex same example. He said, you know, the interface of this insect is they're not tuned to see reality. They're tuned to see fitness payoffs, yeah. what helps them survive. And so the stubbies were- Super confused. stimuli. Super stimuli. So that, yeah. that's where that's where that's it. That's, it was the simulation crisis or something, yeah. or the, it might've been part of the addiction crisis. Super stimuli crisis. We've created a world of super stimulus basically. Right, right. Yeah. Which, which hacks our interface. Yeah. So now kids can watch porn that's easily available. And then when they have an actual sexual relationship, they're like, what is this? Mm. This is flat and one, you know, it's not what I, 
And mm. I've, I've already hacked into like every possible dopamine response I can get from imagery. Yeah. And this imagery is not doing the things on the TV. Yeah. So this, th this all collides then to fracture us into the mimetic tribes that then go to war. Mm. And each of them feels it's existential. Like yeah. it's the end times if we don't win. Yeah, uh -huh. and then he raised the idea of the mimetic mediator, or mimetic mediation being the 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 central role that we need to defuse the culture war, uh, which is that's very right. Interesting. That's right, because then he talked about things like clean bias and having debates that are yeah. that are uh, aimed at truth and the mimetic mediator, who, which has not emerged yet. Mm. He's done a few experiments around that and the idea of the anti-debate which is a debate or a dialogue that's aimed towards that's right. um, increasing connection, increasing understanding rather than winning. Right. So this is, yeah, this is a project that's kind of being being done at the moment is how do you trial genuine exchange of ideas that is not oriented towards one person um, being right and the other person being wrong? But yeah. How do you get somewhere new together? You know, and I don't, this is interesting because I don't know how much of this is personality. There are certain personality types that really value being right. Mm. So that's a deep value. Mm. Uh, my personality type is more like, you know, you, you're relying on others to help you understand and you don't trust yourself and so on. But but this idea that Haidt calls it, um, in, in his book, The Happiness Hypothesis, he calls it a sense of moral elevation. Mm. So when you see something that's so amazingly good, like you're like that, you feel it's like an expansion sense. Mm. I get that sense when I see opposing views come to an understanding, like mm. do a synthesis where they're not fighting each other. Nobody's winning. It's just, oh, whoa, 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 we've evolved something new. I get a sense of moral elevation. Now mm. the question is, is that unique to a particular personality type or can mm. we start conditioning that into people where that's the, that's the dopamine mm. boost? Well, then you've set up conditions for success in terms of re yeah. Con reconciliation. Yeah. yeah, this is a question that I've, yeah, I've wrestled with a little bit as well. It's like, is it possible for nuance to give us the same kind of hit of mm. dopamine as we get from tribalism right, right. now? Right. And I, I think there is, I think I look at the communities of people that have coalesced around some of these ideas and that's what, they get excited by mm. the the kind of integration and so it's about creating enough attractors partly it's partly it's because we also need to create a hierarchy or a status hierarchy around this as well mm. because we're such status seeking creatures yeah and that's a deep wiring is that at the moment the status is assigned to those who win the debates or to those who are kind of like best people in a kind of like dog eat dog dynamic. So how do we create status hierarchies or ecosystems that are valuing different things? So that's a really key part of it as well, is like that certain status is is elevate, is assigned to people who are able to hold multiple perspectives or are able to kind of mediate between different tribes or to, to do things in a different way. And that, that attractor, it's like, how do you make this stuff cool at the end yeah, of the day? Like yeah. this is a, this is something I think ultimately we need to crack mm -hmm. and I think we will because I think the, the, the conversation, like this is something I've always wrestled with, how do you make personal growth stuff cool? Right. And I think you can do that. Like if you have, for example, at the moment, what what's cool in, in an environment like say the one that Joe Rogan is in, it's like, Kind of, kind of being physically pro, physical prowess, dumping so, in an ice so bath. How, and, so how? Yeah. Can, yeah, dumping in an ice bath, which is how personal you, growth. Yeah, yeah. How can you then sort of say, well, you you think you're, you you think you're you're hard? Have you done shadow work? Have right. you really confronted your right. your demons? Right. And I think there's some element of that in a way with with the valuing of psychedelics, the valuing of ayahuasca, the valuing of DMT. Like right. you've got to get over your egoic patterns. So I think there is a movement already towards more than it's more than just being a jock it's like how can you how can you make valuable and aspirational the self trans or the self growth and pro the process of awakening i think it's kind of happening already like if you're look if you're paying attention to the culture it's yeah. already you're seeing it and i think we're we're at a potentially an inflection point post pandemic where that becomes much more widespread. 
because so many more people are asking those questions now about meaning, about purpose, about which is where we began the conversation, which is quite nice. Yeah, you know, and I think if I'm reading between the lines, what I feel is it's a, it's, it's a bigger problem for men mm. in that they are less open, you know, they're more skeptical. This is new age, woo woo, garbage, yeah. whatever. And then Rogan is jumping in an ice bath. He's talking about his DMT. He's, mm. you know, so at least that's starting to normalize some aspects of that, the more mm. masculine aspects of, I'm gonna yeah. go in an ice bath. Or Wim Hof is another, Wim Hof is another perfect, perfect example of oh, someone and, who's basically doing an incredible job of making spiritual practice yeah. relevant to men. Relevant by, to men. By connecting it to things that men care about. He's crushing it. I, I know a lot of very, archetypal masculine emergency physician mm. uh, ma males who love Wim Hof. Like yeah. it's their it's their gateway drug to awakening. Yeah. And it, what's interesting, it's the emergency people that are the most like, hey man, you know, I heard about this meditation retreat. Like, bro, mm. you're silent for 21 days, bro. Like that's, that's the warrior's hardcore. path. Hardcore. That's hardcore, man. Your American accent, pretty good too. And um, and so there there is a crack there. And then they come back and they're like, yeah. man, I've been just, I've been so egoically bound to this anger that I've never let go of about my mom and whatever it is. And you're like, dude, that turned quick <laughs> from like a bro fest to like just total vulnerability. And that's, mm. that's the magic. That's mm. the Trojan horse almost, yeah. Yeah, this feels like a nice completion because it's where we, Began. It's where we began, yeah. Um, and I think it's I think it's important. I feel like there is a a window for opportunity for those of us who are interested in awakening and all of these questions of purpose, of personal growth. Post pandemic, I'm hearing a lot of a lot of my friends who are doing this kind of work, especially even even at like big corporates, are now realizing there's a new openness to it. Mm. Partly partly weirdly contingent is the fact that because of Zoom, the barrier between work and home has, yeah, has dissolved. dissolved. Yeah. So people are now like, it, it's not any more just doing personal growth to be better at work. It's personal growth. Like the, pro, the, the workshops that they're offering to some of these big corporates are about every aspect of your life mm. because you're the same person at home that you are at work and, and the divi dividing line is, is no longer there in the same way. Mm. So it feels like a window of opportunity right now that um, I'm really interested in whatever comes next for um, me personally after Rebel Wisdom. There's a few sort of personal growth oriented projects that I'm really interested in starting up in the UK in particular, because I think there's a, we've always been very suspicious of personal growth stuff in the UK. Mm. A few different kind of Stiff reasons. upper lips. Mm. There's a fear of, there's a, there's a taboo around privacy. Ah which has manifest as a sort of island nation. We've always been much less kind of emotionally coherent and, and, and emotionally vulnerable than the Americans. I mean, we, we, yeah, we're, we, we're, we're a problem. Yeah. Can you please stop <laughs> bleeding all over me? <laughs> sort of thing. But also there's also a taboo around taboo against earnestness, which is something that, um, a, there's an amazing book called Watching the English by a woman called Kate Fox, where she mm. talks about this, mm. that we will always subvert things with humor. That sounds familiar. You cannot take yourself too seriously, which is a, which is a fantastic thing because it stopped us, I think, going down like the, the, the kind of extremism path. Yeah, yeah. Extremists yeah. don't get very far in the UK. As yeah. George Orwell said, if the Nazis tried kind of goose stepping around London, everyone would laugh at laugh them. Laugh them out of the place. Yeah. yeah. Like, that's a, a real positive is that kind of subverting everything through humor that we do in the UK. Yeah. But it's not very good when it comes to personal growth where you have to mean it. Yeah. You have to, you have to really mean it. Yeah. It's like in, in, a, in a kind of, and the British find that incredibly intense. If we were doing like a kind of relational practice where I was kind of working with you or we're talking about our parents or our upbringing or whatever, I'd find it deeply uncomfortable and be wanting to joke about it nonstop. Nonstop. To hey, kind of I'm subvert kind of... the intensity. Uh, maybe you're British. <laughs> yeah, I might be because I've had that. I've, I've been complained about by others that I'm that way. Yeah. 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 But So there's this taboo around earnestness and there's this taboo around privacy that I think has stopped us. The personal growth angle, uh, personal growth, no one's ever created a an aspirational personal growth brand in the UK. Hmm. I think for those reasons. And so where it has appeared in the UK, it's appeared in places like um, Findhorn or places like Osho Leela, which some people may be familiar with. 
it's new age. It's right. a new age aesthetic. It's right. not aspirational. If you're kind of like not already in that kind of world, you go there and you're like, mm, it's not really my tribe. Even though I'm attracted to it for these reasons or these reasons, it's never really landed. So I think there's a real opportunity for something new in the UK. And I think if, if, and I'd love to be part of this, I'm kind of already in conversation with a few people about kind of creating a, a, a more aspirational personal growth brand, for want of a better word, in mm. the UK. I feel like if we can crack it for the UK, make it cool and aspirational for the UK, it's got an opportunity to be that for elsewhere because the UK is a very If you can do it there, you can do it anywhere. Kind of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, okay, if you do that, first mm. of all, Congratulations on being a cult leader. I yeah. approve highly. Second, I wanna be your celebrity spokesperson. Uh, and I'm only a celebrity in medical circles. So you'll end up with a bunch of ER bros who'll be like, bro, <laughs> I love this brand, man. Lulu uh, Lulu Fuller, uh, yeah. meditation and personal growth. Dave, uh, Dave Hoff. Dave Hoff, that's yeah. even better. That's even better. Well, you know what? I gotta say this. If anybody's gonna be a part of that, that I'd wanna see be a part of that, it's you. That I've gotten to know you over these last couple of days. I have to say like, um, I am really impressed with your your own passion and dedication to personal growth, even though it's hard. And and again, as a Brit, it's probably even harder. Do you know how deeply uncomfortable hearing this? Yes, you feel? I know. It's That's a... why I'm doing it. Because since you <laughs> since you part of my personality is to is to drive a wedge in people's weaknesses when I finally yeah. detect them, and I finally detected yours. So now, yeah. joking aside, I mean, I'm it's it's you've taught me an immense amount. You continue to teach me. You teach your audience. The rebel wisdom arc has been a gift to all of us mm -hmm. that are trying to make sense of the world and grow and have this integral perspective. And so it was really f great to be able to sit and talk for how many hours now? Two and yeah. some, yeah. And if anyone's still watching this, then <laughs> congratulations. Congrats. Um, yeah, and I wanna um, yeah say how much I valued connecting with you since we first connected. I mean, there's been, I, I saw your, the first thing I saw of yours was the, the piece where you just called out the the medical community during COVID. It's oh, like, yeah. this needs to end now. And I was yeah. like, whoa, who is this guy? Yeah. And then I can't remember how we got put in contact, but but immediately I was like, ah, yeah. And there's something, what I find really fascinating is I've, I've realized the longer I've been doing this, it's actually a relatively small world. When I've really connected with someone, it's happened like three or four times now where I've been like, I love what that guy is doing, or I love what that person is doing. And I'll contact them and they're like, I love what you're doing. Yeah. And and that's happened with the person who who wrote my favorite song, Alex Ebert. Wow. I connected with him, like I love his song Truth. I think it's the best account of awakening there is anywhere. Ah, I haven't heard this. Um, yeah. it's, a, it's incredible. Um, and he, I've been admiring his, his work for ages. I got in contact with him and he's like, dude, I love your work. <sighs> And with my favorite musicians, same thing. With my hero from my musical hero growing up, Tim Booth of James, who's got the same haircut as you. Um, <laughs> he, yeah, turns out when I connected with him, he wasn't actually aware of Rebel, Rebel Wisdom, but as soon as I connected with him, it's just like total, total kind of bro love. So from you're the telling beginning. me there's hope that if I reach out to Weird Al, he'll actually know who I am? Yeah, he definitely knows who you are. <laughs> I think he's already got a restraining order against you. Yeah, so. he might. Yeah, I keep sending him ideas. Don't yeah. you love it when that happens? Man, yeah. that, that's... So, man, it's been a real pleasure. Like, there's been a level of kind of... Um, what's the word? Um, Homoerotic uh, energy? That's exactly what I was looking for. That's a, <laughs> See, I'm diffusing, my tongue. I'm I'm diffusing my tongue. The, the earnestness with uh, humor right now. See? There you go. I there you go. I'm the same. Yeah, alignment is what yeah, I was going to say. That's a good Sort point. of... Um, brother from another mother. Yeah, absolutely, man. You're like uh, the better British version of me with a cooler beard and more hair and taller and smarter. Um, all that <laughs> said, uh, I love it, man. So can't wait to talk again. We got to do this because post-pandemic- It's I mean, dangerous. You, you can shake hands. We're I can't believe you're not wearing a mask, man. You know what? I'm wearing one on, on my crotch because I'm worried about monkey pox. There you, you go. Know? So I, now the CDC said, you can wear a mask about monkey pox. And I was like, well, where would I mask? There the you junk. Go. I did. I should have told you before. I am actually riddled with monkeypox. Oh no, but I, I could smell it. Yeah. I have a second sense about monkeypox. We never did talk about second selves, but we'll do it next time. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. 